Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, flatten deeply nested array. This is actually a pretty practical problem, I think. Or at least in my case, knowing this would have been helpful. So we're given a multi-dimensional array and a depth value n. This n does not actually tell us the depth of this array. Like for example, we can see this array has a array nested inside of it and another array nested inside of it, which has one array nested inside of that. So it looks like this one goes three layers deep like this is the outer layer and then an inner array and then the third inner array but i guess calculating it based on depth we start with zero then this is one and then the inner one is a depth of two to flatten an array like this would just be to take every single value that's nested in any of the subarrays and put them into a single array but that's not quite what we're doing here we can see even the output does have some nested arrays inside of that and in this case, the input is actually exactly the same as the output. And the reason is because our n value in this case is zero. That tells us we only want to flatten to a depth of zero. So essentially, we're not flattening this array at all because we're only looking at the values on the zeroth level. So taking these individual values and we're treating this first subarray as a single value and just straight appending it to the output. Same thing with this big guy. We're just taking it and adding it straight straight to the output, same thing with this guy. Now, when it gets a bit more interesting is let's say a depth of one. So in this case, we of course take the one, two, three, and then this guy, we do go one level deeper this time. So we take the four, five, and six and add them to the output. Then we find another nested array. This is also one level deep. So we start looking at it value by value, seven, eight, add those. Now we get to another subarray, but this one is a bit too deep. We can't go two layers deep. We can only go one layer deep. So we treat this as a single value, add it to the output, but that 12 over there is not very deep. It's one layer outside of this one. So we take that, add it to the output. This one is one layer deep. So we take the 13, 14, and 15, add them to the output. And that's pretty much the problem. Now, quickly, before I actually solve it, I want to show you a slight application of this, or at least an area where this does come up. And one area is promises. Suppose we have, in this case, a single promise and it just resolves to one. It doesn't really matter. We could add a set timeout here, but I just made this to make it simple. And the second one over here is a promise. And when this one one resolves, we have a chain here. We have a callback that's going to do something here, but when it returns, it's actually going to return a promise as well. So this is a promise that when it resolves, it also returns a promise. So then when you call promise.then over here, do we expect result to be equal to a promise? No, it's not. Even though that might seem like what it should do, what's what JavaScript is doing under the hood here though, is automatically flattening the promise. When you call then on it, you don't want the promise, you want the value. That's why you would call then on the promise. So that's something that's good to know and that's not something to take for granted because in RxJS, which is a library that you might've heard of, it's a popular JavaScript library, it's synonymous with observables. And this is probably one of the biggest reasons that people don't like programming in Angular because it makes great use of observables and they do not automatically do flattening. You have to handle that yourself. And that's one of the reasons it can get kind of complicated when you're dealing with observables. But now back to the problem. Obviously, one way to solve this problem would definitely be with recursion. Another way would probably be just to imitate the recursion using a data structure like a stack. But I think the recursive solution is sufficient. So I'm going to create a helper function and that helper function is going to return our result. So when I call the helper function here, I'm just going to return the return value of that. It's going to make our life a lot easier to have a result declared outside of the scope of the helper function. And the reason is because if we don't do that, then within this recursive function, we're going to have to take the return values from the recursive calls and sort of join the subarrays together. That's not going to be very efficient and it's a lot harder to do it that way. The first time I interviewed at Google, that's actually what I did for a similar problem to this. Well, it wasn't very similar, but it had like the same idea of having like a array declared on the outside. I thought this solution would have been too easy. So I went with the more complicated one where we don't have like an outer array. But then at the end of the interview, my interviewer told me that I made the solution over 
more complicated. And even though I knew the easier solution, I probably should have clarified with the interviewer if they were okay with that, which they were. So a lesson learned in that case. But uh, continuing with the problem, with this helper function, what are we keeping track of? Believe it or not, we don't want the index. We want which array we are currently at. Because if we're just given a single array and it's not nested at all, we don't really care about the index of any of the values. We can literally just iterate through all of the values with a for of loop like this. And for each of those values, we would probably just say result dot push that value to the result. That would be the case if we did not have a nested array, but we know that's not the case. So how do we know if this value is not just a value, it's actually an array itself? Well, we can just get the type of it when we'd say type of val is equal to object. Thankfully, in this problem, I don't think we're going to be given any objects. We're always dealing with arrays or values. So if it's an object, we probably want to execute the recursive case where for the helper, we don't pass in the array. We pass in this value, which we also know happens to be an array. But there's one thing we're not keeping track of, and that's the depth. We do want to keep track of what depth we are currently at because at some point we probably don't want to keep doing the recursive case. If we reach the maximum depth, even if this happens to be an array, we still want to push it to the result. We don't want to execute the recursive case at some point. So how do we know what that point is? Well, they pretty much told us. So here I'm gonna add a second condition and the depth, our current depth, is still less than n. As long as it hasn't exceeded n, then we can do the recursive case, but we should probably update the depth at that point and pass in depth plus one. And for this case, we don't really execute the recursive case anyway, so nothing to do over there. But from within this function, we probably do want to return the result because we're expecting that out here. And that's pretty much the entire code, but you don't want to forget to pass in your variables here. So let's pass in the array and let's pass in the initial depth of zero. Now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.